Hi all, I'm Dr. Clark here again. For this lecture in fish and wildlife, we're going to talk about diseases, fish and wildlife diseases. Um, that will be broken up into quite a few different categories. Um, lots of things get lumped together when you talk about diseases. Uh, these can be, you know, things like bacterial infections, viral infections, and parasites and and even other things like poor uh, nutrient levels, poor environmental health, these kind of things can all be wrapped into one thing that we call wildlife or fish diseases. Now we're going to look at a, a few examples of these. This is kind of just an overview of diseases. Um, for most of you, if you're actually going into fish and wildlife uh, you'll probably have a course in parasites or a course in wildlife diseases because there are so many and <clears throat> the importance of management or early detection of some of these diseases uh, is tremendous in certain regions okay so with that being said let's kind of dive into the subject and uh, go through some things so like I said before, types of diseases, I'm going to kind of break this up into two main types of diseases. You have environmental and nutritional diseases, and then you have infectious diseases. Okay? Now, sometimes these two are directly linked. Okay? If the environment is poor, the individual has maybe a compromised immune system, then a virus, a parasite, or a bacterial infection can occur, and you have both environmental effect and infectious disease effect. In other cases, maybe it's just a plain nutritional disease where the organism's eating something that is toxic and causing a toxic effect um, or toxins to build up in the individual's tissue. Okay. And that could just happen to be a mere chance event where you might have an extremely large uh, population of certain toxic plant or certain toxic fungi and wildlife, because it's so abundant, are consuming it and um, paying the price for doing so. Okay, this this stuff occurs um, sometimes. It's confusing and sometimes it's hard to tease out what's the actual root of the disease but that's why certain wildlife um, biologists are trained in disease management or um, infectious diseases okay now I want to bring up a point when we talk about different diseases and different stresses on an organism they're not always lethal, okay? And so if you think of a energy intake, or if you think of an organism, there are three main things that energy go into. G or growth, and this is putting on size, mass. This is growth of new fur, new feathers. This is just growth in general, okay? R reproduction okay and so as an organism ages the pie or the pieces of the pie or the energy that is being intaked okay is divvied out differently as you can imagine if you're a looking at a young organism say maybe a young deer a fawn um it's early growth all the energy that's coming in um early on it's really for growth and M, which is maintenance, okay? So for growth and maintenance, that's where all the energy is going to. Now, how it's divvied up will depend purely on the environment that the organism lives in. We'll get to that in a second, okay? Once that organism hits reproductive size and age, and is reproductively active or can be reproductively active, then the third piece of the pie comes in, reproduction. Now, again, this will be 
determined by, well, what's the season? What's the age of the organism? Is the organism going to reproduce every year or every five years or every month? Okay, so these these things play a big role on the pieces of the pie and how they're divvied up. But one key component to this is that M piece, that maintenance piece. Now, maintenance is not just maintenance of <clears throat> cells, okay, and that's where a lot of energy goes, but also maintenance of your immune system, okay, maintenance of any wounds or anything like that. So this is, you know, basically the catch-all for everything that doesn't fit under growth and reproduction. <clears throat> And it can be a huge piece of the pie. In fact, if, let's say, an organism is infected with the disease, um, then maybe the pie looks like this. Maybe the energy is shifted to where, yes, the organism is of reproductive size and age, but it's not dedicating a lot of energy to reproduction because now it has to dedicate this, this large amount of energy to its maintenance, okay? So it's trying to maintain tissues, it's trying to supply maybe energy, maybe this is a parasite, an internal parasite, a tapeworm or a nematode or a trematode or something like that, and maybe it's supplying energy to that parasite. So your maintenance piece goes up while your reproduction and growth go down. This is also the case, in some cases, maybe the organism is big enough to reproduce and um, doesn't live for very long. This happens a lot in, say, fish. Okay? Maybe the growth piece is completely gone then. Maybe it's just a sliver of growth. And maintenance is big and reproduction is big. So the organism basically... It's putting all of its eggs into one basket saying, all right, I have an a infection or the environment's terrible or nutrition wise, we don't have enough energy to supply all pieces of the pie. So what it's doing is it's saying, all right, uh, it's hedging its bet against living another year and it's sinking as much energy as it can into reproduction. And we see this often too. Now, from a management point of view, it's important to know well, what is your wildlife or what is your fisheries unit? What are they doing? Yeah. Are they nutritionally stressed? Are they environmentally stressed? Are they parasitically stressed? Okay. And that's where that management piece really comes into play. Some things can be changed quite easily. I mean, as we, being humans, as, as we often think it's not possible or it's hard to do, um, changing the environment is really easy. Okay? We do it every single day, just often it's in a negative manner, not a positive manner. Okay? But changing the environment, making a stream that might be, you know, semi toxic because of an you know a junkyard or a metal yard or some pollution source upstream that's an easy fix remove the pollution source okay? or maybe that stream's too warm because we decided to cut all the trees along the stream down well replant trees Create some shade. Now, it's not going to be an effect of today, okay, in the case of trees and things like that, but those fixes are easy. Okay? And you can use those to decide okay, well, if there's an environmental stress on the organism, let's do something. And, you know, we have before and after data. Let's see what happens, okay? Nutritional diseases, nutritional stress. Sometimes this is really easy fixes. Okay. The organism, it might be over consuming or it might be under consuming certain nutrients okay, or certain material. Okay. It can be an easy fix. Often 
The reason why there's nutritional diseases or nutritional stress on organisms has to do with human causes. Okay? Maybe we overgraze the land with our livestock and there's not enough vegetation for that group of organisms. Maybe that group of organisms is just eating single source material or maybe we have a source of material on the landscape that's not good for the organism okay? and it's causing obesity in the organism. There are lots of ways at which nutritional diseases are the direct effect of us. Okay? Now infectious diseases, it depends on the disease. Okay? It depends on what we're talking about. Bacterial infections, they've been around forever. Okay? I mean, bacteria is one of the first group of organisms to evolve on the planet. So once other organisms came and bacteria started infecting those organisms, infectious diseases from bacterial or virus infections or even parasite infections have been around for a very long time. In fact, if you look at the human genome, we carry a lot of genetic imprints, a lot of genes from previous viral infections. There's lots of books out there. If you're interested in that, you can you know, send me an email and I'll give you some titles of books about you know, our genome and, and the viral infections that we've had before. Play a huge role. That's why we actually have an immune system is because we've been infected with bacterial diseases, viral diseases, and parasites for a very long time. Okay? Now, that being said, there are a lot of things that we do that can increase that infectious disease okay? by having you know, no predators on the landscape. So the diseases stay in the organism and the organism is alive and can have an effect in infection or an effect in infecting other organisms within the herd. Okay? Predator removal is one of the biggest deals when it comes to infectious diseases. The predators are not consuming the individuals that are diseased any longer. Okay? So that puts the onus on the hunter. How many hunters are going to go out there and if they see a deer walking, you know, sideways and it's, its fur is hanging off of it and it doesn't look good or has big bulbous and big, um, you know, swollen areas, how many individuals are going to shoot that and want to take it home and eat it? Not very many people. But to a wolf, a coyote, a cougar, bears, man, that's a good meal. It's not going to run very fast. You're going to take it down without expending a lot of energy and you're going to consume it. Okay? And so from that point of view, we as managers of the landscape have really took upon ourselves to deal with wildlife diseases because we've removed a lot of the predators that would have done it for us. All right, so let's jump into some of these and look at these in a little more detail, okay? If we look at environmental diseases, okay? So environmental diseases or environmental health, it's defined as the connection between the physical environment, the ecological health, and human health. So when we talk about environmental health, we're often concerned in the news and things like that with human health. Well, what happens to air pollution or how is clean water or toxic water affecting human health? Well, to get at the human health, often we need to look at the wildlife because they're the indicators often of the environment. Okay, the canary in the coal mine okay, is often the organisms that live every day in that environment that we often are the root of the pollution or the root of the problem. Okay? And so there's lots of situations in which we can examine things like avian keratin disorder. Okay, this has been linked to climate change and temperature of the eggs in which the organism is hatching from. Now we don't know a lot about 
some of these effects of climate change on, on some of these things, and it might not be directly re related to climate change, but it's occurring. Okay? And um, it could be directly related to other pollutants in, in the organism's life, in the organism's food sources, water sources, et cetera. Okay? And we're working these out. There's a lot of researchers that are examining those effects. But currently, it's been linked to climate change. And so here, you can see this is a chickadee. Its bill, its bill does not normally look like this. It's a very small, thin bill. Okay, they eat small seeds, but they have this keratin disorder, which causes the bill to elongate. And you can only imagine that it's going to be very difficult for this organism to consume food with a bill that's misshapen like that. Okay, olapica, okay, or the loss of hair. There are lots of reasons for the loss of hair in mammals or loss of feathers in birds and things like that. Okay, some have been linked to climate change or, you know, changes in temperature profiles, longer, uh, you know, longer summer seasons, shorter winter seasons. Okay? The organism doesn't have the ability to regulate kind of its coat. Okay? Remember, a lot of organisms, a lot of mammals will change their coat. They'll shed off, you know, kind of a summer coat and put on a, a more dense winter coat, and sometimes that comes with a change in color, okay? But with climate change, we've seen that we have more incident, incident, incidences of um, things like alopecia. Okay? We see this not in just, um, you know, temper things like uh, deer and elk and things like that, but we see it in polar environments with things like polar bears and even wolves and, and things like that. Non-viability of eggs, okay? we see this in, across a lot of different organisms, okay? birds, amphibians, reptiles, fish, um, that viability of the egg, sometimes it's determined by the temperature of the environment. Okay? So in things like turtles and, and um, you know, some species of fish, it, you know, the viability is directly related to the temperature of the egg. Um, even amphibians, temperature of the egg. Now, in the case of turtles, the sex is also determined by the temperature of the egg. So if you have a changing temperature profile, you might have a change in how many males you have in an environment or how many females you have in an environment. It may not be as drastic of a problem in things like birds because birds are incubating their eggs. But you have to realize, let's, let's just think about the temperature profile of an egg and a bird gets off the nest to let the eggs kind of regulate their temperature but what if it's so hot that when the bird gets off that the egg temperature doesn't regulate itself it stays super hot okay you can have different enzyme effects and and we now know that there's a lot of things that can be affected genetically by different temperatures, especially at the embryo level. Okay? We're just barely getting a grasp on how many genes are controlled by the environment, whether that be temperature of the environment, nutrition that's coming in, you know, physical stresses of the environment through maybe chemicals or what's going on. But we do know that there is a connection to our genes that has an environmental point or environmental premise. Okay? And then of course, there's lots of pollutants from the environmental point of view. Okay? And this could just be toxic water sources, okay? toxic runoff, that could be heavy metals, it could be plastic in, in our oceans, it could be, you know, there's just all kinds of pollutants from a water's point of view, but not just water, okay? air pollutants plants okay so in in a lot of environments plants are really good at removing pollutants out of the soil out of the water sources okay well that's great but what does a plant do with it most plants don't have the capability of breaking down those heavy metals so what do they do with it they store it 
And then another organism comes around and eats it. And now that organism has heavy metals, okay, which can be toxic to that organism. So there are lots of environmental effects or what we call environmental diseases that are directly related to, often directly related to changes that humans have made on the planet, okay? Digging up heavy metals, okay? Polluting streams and oceans and rivers and lakes, polluting the air, okay? um, ultimately causing the temperature of the planet to rise over a, a very short period of time, not allowing for organisms to adapt to environmental change. Now, remember, a lot of organisms have been living on this planet for millions upon millions of years, and they've had the capability to adapt to a change in the environment. When you change it really quick, okay, then the adaptations don't happen as fast. The organism's population will decrease typically, or you might see some side effects of those environmental problems, environmental diseases pop up, okay? Let's look at nutritional diseases, all right? So nutritional diseases, I kind of like to break it up into two different types. You have overconsumption or underconsumption. We often think about nutritional diseases from mainly just underconsumption. Oh, they're malnourished, okay? I mean, if I say something is malnourished, if I say, okay, there's a coyote and it's malnourished, okay? Most people can picture that organism in, you know, in their head and say, okay, well, you can probably see its rib cages, or you might be able to count every rib, okay? You might be able to see its hip bones because there's so little, um, you know, muscle or fat around those regions that you can see actual bones sticking through. Okay? Malnourished, undernourished, okay? But overconsumption is often a problem also that we deal with in fish and wildlife management. And that could be overconsumption of good things, okay? So maybe you have organisms that are coming into a region and they're consuming people food. Okay? They're consuming alfalfa fields. They're consuming, you know, garbage. They're consuming, people are feeding them. People are feeding them at the bird feeders. These kind of things. Sometimes that overconsumption can cause things like obesity. Or they can cause an organism to become more acclimated to humans, which then can cause some other problems down the, down the road. Overconsumption can also be a problem with overconsuming bad things, okay? Things that humans have deposited in the environment, okay? So things like heavy metals, okay? Mercury, okay? Or lead, these kind of things that we have, you know, deposited in the environment due to processes that we, you know, are in charge of, whether that be like, you know, coal fire plants or whether that be, you know, paper mills or whether that be just the invention of toxic shot, like lead shot, okay, or um, sinkers for, you know, fishing, okay, lead sinkers, these kind of different, different things can have that effect on the environment. For example, these, this is some data that has been that I pulled from, um, you know, a paper about the effects of lead on uh, mainly on condors, but also the effects on really any organism that might be consuming. You know, typically deer is what we're talking about here, but consuming deer meat that, you know, the organism's been shot, it might have got away um, and died, or, you know, the carcass is left on, on the landscape after someone shot it with lead. Okay. Um, but this is also, you know, this data is out there for ducks when we use lead shot on ducks, okay, which in majority of regions is against the law, but you can still use lead shot on upland birds, okay? 
So you use lead shot on grouse or quail or, or those organisms. It's still legal in a lot of states to use lead shot. So some of that might be coming from that. There's that data out there. But at any rate, what, what I'm showing you here is this is condor data, California condor data. And it's showing you the blood lead levels of condors, okay? That line here in the middle is the mean, the average, okay? So the average in 1997 was sitting right around 100, okay? And then it bounces up and down, okay? The nanograms per milliliter of blood, okay? Well, the important piece is putting these two graphs together. If you look at the blood levels, or the amount of lead in the blood that as you increase it, the direct effects on the bird drastically increases. So if obviously if blood lev lead levels are really low, there's little to no effect okay, on the organism's ALAD activity. Okay? As you increase the blood lead, or increase the amount of lead in their blood, you can see that that activity level decreases drastically. Okay? And really sitting at about 250 nanograms per milliliter is approaching lethal, lethal activity levels or um, a lethal dosage for uh, condors. So if you see, uh, you know, sitting at 100, okay, quite a bit lower, but there is an effect on the organism. But when you're jumping up to 250, okay, in this region, um, you can start to see that there's a drastic effect on these organisms, okay? Now, the nice thing is, is over the years, okay, the condor populations have been increasing, okay, or they could actually look at the effect um, or the blood levels, okay, and many more condors. That's a good sign, okay, because condors were an endangered species for a very long time in every state, okay, and so it's nice to see that those populations are increasing and researchers are out there checking these blood levels, etc., but the other problem is we're starting to see, you know, that there might be an effect of lead on these organisms. So that being said, what can managers do? Well, prevent people from using lead. Okay? No more lead shot. Um, no more lead bullets. Okay? We have alternatives to this, and we've had alternatives to these bullets for a very long time. Okay? Now, will there be an uprising? Of course. There was when waterfowl, you had to go to steel shot instead of lead um, <clears throat> with waterfowl. Well, now most people who shoot ducks, they have never shot. The majority of individuals that are shooting ducks on the landscape today have never shot a duck with a lead shot. So they don't even know if there is a flight pattern different between the shots or anything like that, which there's claims that there is, and maybe there is, maybe there's not, okay? But they don't even know the difference because they've never done it. So yes, when you first initiate the rule change, of course there's going to be pushback. Okay, but if the rule change is beneficial to scavengers, okay. Now we're talking about condors, okay? but what if we were talking about things like ravens, okay, which are going to eat a lot more rabbits and they're going to eat a lot more maybe grouse and pheasants and, and upland birds that have been shot with pellets, okay? And we're not talking about a single bullet that's going in to a deer. We're talking about lots of lead bullets that might be going into a rabbit, okay, that's left on the landscape, okay? A lot of people who shoot rabbits, they might go out and they might shoot jackrabbits or things like that, and they shoot them with a shotgun, okay? And they don't eat them. They just shoot them for fun, for sport. That lays on the landscape, okay? What's the effect on scavengers? What's the effect on coyotes, ravens, crows, things like that? 
Um, those studies haven't been done, okay? or not a complete study has been done on those. So it could be a problem. Okay, under consumption, it can be directly related to human technology, um, like a plastic jug. Here you can see this coyote got its head stuck in this plastic jug. Okay, it's you can start to see its ribs, okay, its hips, things like that. It's malnourished um, because of an invention by humans. Okay? Now that's not always the case. Okay, um, you know, it's just pointing at that connection between an environmental disease and a nutritional di disease. Okay? Pollution can be that direct connection. Okay? And then there's other examples where it's out of control of humans, really. Okay? Like the, you know, the mass die-off of about 300 elk that occurred near Rollins, Wyoming, because they're eating paramella, a type of lichen. Kind of a fringy lichen. Um, that lichen poisoned these elk. Now, people would say, well, that's, we can't do anything about that. Well, some people might say, well, maybe we can. Maybe they were consuming that lichen because there wasn't enough grassland or there wasn't enough other vegetation available. Okay. Maybe we overgrazed that region. Now, I don't know this one particularly. Well, so I'm not going to say that we are overgrazing in that region, and that's why they consumed it. It could have just been that paramella exploded, like the population, and there was just tons of this lichen around, and the elk ate the lichen, and they died from it. They got poisoned by it. Okay? That happens. Okay, wildlife will eat, you know, things that are very abundant in nature. Sometimes those abundant things are toxic towards the wildlife, and you can have that kind of effect. Okay? That being said, it also could be the result of not enough nutrition on the landscape okay, for that population. Now, that also could be the problem. Maybe there's too many elk in that region. Okay? So no matter what you do, maybe you shut down grazing completely, and you still have too many elk. This is why wildlife managers manage the landscape holistically. You have to look at well, how much you know vegetation is available. What's the nutritional needs? What's your population size? Okay. What's the environmental effects? Okay. How many other organisms are going to be eating those resources? These kind of things have to play that kind of role in that decision on how big of population do you want or can you have because when 300 elk die okay, it makes national news when you have 300 elk dying and no one knows why okay. all right so let's jump over to infectious diseases and we'll talk about the three main types that I, you know that i'm going to talk about there are other infectious diseases um Okay, that we're just not going to spend too much time on. Okay? One that we I will just briefly mention, chronic wasting disease. Okay? That's a pyron or protein disease. And the reason why I bring that up is um, it's pretty important for states like Wyoming, Colorado, Nebraska, because there's uh, a large source of chronic wasting disease in our ungulate populations, okay? That's a protein disease. It's not related to bacteria or virus or um, parasites, okay? It's a protein-based disease, okay? It's a misfolded protein. Um, we don't know a super amount on it. We do know that it's transferred from, you know, like, wet surfaces so if a you know if a deer comes upon you know a carcass of another deer and nasals nasals it you know sniffs it it can transfer pyron to that organism that organism can get it okay um you know it can stay in the soil for a long period of time so there are lots of things about cwd or chronic wasting disease that we don't know 
about, um, but we do know that like mad cow disease and other pyron um, diseases or protein-based diseases, we understand kind of how they can get transmitted and things like that. Okay, so I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time talking about that because um, there aren't really that many pyron diseases out there. Um, they can be very serious. They can definitely cause uh, population changes, and managers do realize they're out there okay, and are managing for them. Okay? Now, that being said, back to bacterial or infectious diseases, because I'm going to talk about, you know, these infectious diseases, ones caused by bacterial infections. But first, we need to talk about a term, zoonotic. Zoonotic bacterial diseases or zoonotic diseases in general, okay, are diseases that can be transferred or transmitted between animals and humans. <clears throat> Okay. So when we say something is zoonotic, that means that um, at least humans can get a variety of that disease. Now, they might not be able to get the exact species, okay, um, or we might not know enough about that disease to know whether or not humans can get it. Maybe humans have um, got the genera of that disease. This is a different species, so we're kind of concerned, and we call it zoonotic anyways. Better safe than sorry in a lot of situations. Okay? But some that we know about okay, are things like infectious diseases that cause diarrhea. So Salmonella, E. coli, Shigella, Campylobacter, okay? these diseases... Um, come directly from wildlife. Now they can come in many different forms. They can come from the skin of wildlife, okay, like salmonella. They can come from fecal material of wildlife, E. coli. Uh, so there are lots of different ways at which you can obtain these infectious diseases or infectious bacteria. Sometimes it's by consumption, sometimes it's by handling, okay. Um, but from a bacteria point of view, majority of the infectious diarrhea, bacteria, diseases are based on, um, you know, actual contact with the organism. It's not an airborne disease. Okay, there are diseases that, you know, live, um, bacteria that lives in the saliva, okay, of an organism, okay, or in the mouth of an organism that you know, can be transferred to to humans through bites, okay? So Staphylococcus, Plasterilla, Streptococcus, Neisseria. The, these are bacterial infections that you can get from being bit. Now, not all of these are wildlife or you're going to get them directly from wildlife. Now, in some cases, you know, domestic animals might house these um infectious diseases also. So you get bit by a dog or something like that, you, you know, you can get staphylococcus from that bite. Okay? You get bit by a coyote, you can get staphylococcus from that bite. Okay? So um, th that's why we consider them zoonotic diseases is because not only do they transfer from animal to human, but they also also transfer from animal to animal okay? and across species many times and many different types of species also. And then there's some others like vector-borne, okay, and these often are uh, caused by bites, but they can also be caused by, again, uh, contact with bodily fluids. Okay, so th simple things uh, and things that most of you are probably familiar with, things like ricochet or you know, Rocky Mountain spot, Spotted Fever, or Borrelia, which is Lyme disease. These come from ticks, typically from ticks. Um, and the, they're zoonotic, though, um, in the sense that mice can carry Lyme disease, deer can carry Lyme disease, okay? humans can get Lyme disease. Okay? And so you, you can get these organisms that harbor that vector-borne bacteria and they house that or they keep that in a population 
Okay? And like I said before, what can managers do about this kind of stuff? Well, you can manage for the population that's harboring that disease. Okay? Typically, it's not human, so you're not going to go out and cull off or kill a bunch of humans because they're not the ones that are harboring Lyme disease. But deer or mice that might be overpopulated in a region could allow for that disease to stay around and be um, more prolific in that region than it would normally be. Other things that would come from contact um, of bodily fluids, things like brucellosis, okay, this is a vector borne that can go from cattle, that can go to elk, it can go to um, uh, bison, it can go to humans, okay, so brucellosis, it's an abortion uh, or aborting kind of disease. Um, so that, now there's lots of varieties of brucellosis, not all of them are directly, but um, the main one that affects wildlife in Wyoming will cause <clears throat> the female to abort the fetus. Um, okay? And then that just increases the chance that the next female gets it. Because if you have a female that aborts her offspring, it's laying there on the ground, um, other females and males, etc., will come by and sniff it. And might get some of that, um, you know, fluid that that houses that bacterial infection on them. They get it on their nose. They suck it in, and now they're infected with brucellosis. Okay, not just elk to elk, but you know, it could be that a cow aborts and an elk sniffs the cow fetus, or um, an elk aborts and a bison sniffs, okay? Um, this can happen quite often. And it's a very big concern in some regions of the United States, especially in regions that you have cattle, bison, elk all together, because um, they can just pass those diseases back and forth um, through contact. Okay. Now, non-zoonotic diseases. I'm not really going to talk about non-zoonotic bacteria diseases, mainly because if they're not zoonotic, um, then they're species specific or maybe genera specific. And <clears throat> I don't have time to go through every genera of wildlife um, uh, and talk about their diseases. Okay. Um, just to let you know, about 71% of all bacteria diseases are zoonotic. So by and large, the majority of bacterial infections or bacterial diseases are going to be zoonotic. Um, so there are, of course, some that are not, and some that are species-specific, genera-specific, or family of organism-specific. Um, but again, like I said, I'm, I'm not really going to concentrate on a single group of organisms. This is an overview of infectious diseases. All right. So there are lots of um, managers out there that, you know, realize this and lots of groups that realize that things, you know, can organisms can harbor some of these diseases and that by having huge populations, say huge populations, of white-tailed deer, um, that's the root of the problem. That's why people are getting Lyme disease is because you have too many deer on the landscape. They're harboring, you know, Lyme disease in them, and then the ticks pick it up, and then the ticks will pass it to a human. Okay, and um, by having more predators in the landscape, smaller populations, more coyotes to eat the mice that are, you know also contributing to this uh, vicious cycle of Lyme disease, um, you know, that kind of management could really decrease the amount of humans that are affected with Lyme disease. Yeah. All right, so it's kind of moving on to another type, and that would be a viral, um, infection. Here's another kind of definition, definition zoonosis, okay, and that's just the when a zoonotic disease is passed on, you know, from one group to another group, 
Um, so from animal to human, okay, it's called zoonosis when that disease moves, okay, and, and has a, affected another group. Now, like I said before, infectious diseases can be bacterial, they can be viruses, which we're talking about now, or they can be parasitic. Okay? And, um, you know, they can be spread from one organism to the next. That's what makes them zoonotic, or that's what makes it zoonosis or zoonosis of um, infectious disease. Okay, so there are lots of viruses out there. Some that, you know, are uh, headline makers all the time, uh, like West Nile. Um, that, you know, can uh, be harbored in birds, pass from a bird to a mosquito, mosquito to a human, okay? HIV, um, which we believe started in primates, okay? um, at least you know, monkeys maybe, and uh, was passed then to humans through blood-to-blood uh, -blood contact, okay? and then can be passed, obviously, through sexual in intercourse and other means like needles and things like that, or blood-to-blood -blood contact, okay? Rabies, another type of virus that's often associated with things like bats and, and um, you know, other vermin, I guess, so raccoons and skunks and other organisms that um, are often associated with uh, having rabies, okay? Most, um, would not associate dogs, but a lot of dogs, um, especially feral dogs or <clears throat> dogs that are not domesticated any longer, um, can hold rabies or can be a uh, vector for rabies. <clears throat> Some of the lesser known ones like Hendra and Nypha, okay, these are coming um, and are starting, the populations are starting to increase um, that are being affected with these different viruses. We think that they started in bats. Now, there, there are just lots um, out there. And so you can poll and you can see, like, there's um, all kinds of things that uh, can be contributed, viruses that can be contributed to animals that have zoonotically passed them to humans. So like SARS, um, you know, the Ebola virus, we believe, started in chimpanzees, and that's why it can have a direct effect on humans, okay? But there are lots of, um, you know, viruses that started or can be harbored in wildlife and then passed to humans, um, and then it might have a direct negative effect on humans. So maybe in the wildlife, maybe it's not affecting the wildlife and killing off a lot of the organisms. But once it gets into a new host, humans, it can wreak rampant. It can go crazy on our immune system and our immune system doesn't have a capability of fighting it off. And it can cause um, huge problems in human populations. Wildlife managers would then, you know, need to realize, okay, well, what's going on? Do we need to um, be concerned with the hantavirus in this region, okay, because that's going to directly affect humans. So maybe the, the mouse or rat population in a region is, is really large and, and you have that hantavirus capability or possibility to pass it on, okay. Maybe the goal population is, is too big and Psittacosis is, is a huge deal in a region, or West Nile is a huge deal because the birds are harboring it. Okay, there's, there's lots of situations where zoonotic diseases or viruses are being passed from wildlife to humans. Now, it also goes back the other way, okay? Um, it can go the other way. Humans can definitely pass some of their viruses to wildlife. That's less documented, mainly because we're not really concerned. We're concerned with wildlife, but we're not concerned about what we're giving wildlife from our viral infections. Um, we don't know that very well. It's harder to track and harder to detect um, what we might be passing back the other way. But 
Once again, it goes both ways. Okay, so why is that of interest? Well, we're interested um, from a wildlife management point of view. Well, we're inter interested in the whole puzzle. Okay, what do wildlife have to do with you know, human populations, can wildlife or wildlife harboring things like Ebola, hantavirus, SARS, okay, can they be passing that on to humans? Um, or, you know, how about human wildlife or human domesticated organisms? What are they passing over to wildlife? Are they passing rabies, um, tuberculosis, anthrax, these different um bacterial infections that might be coming over, okay? and then what can livestock pass to humans, okay? So just because a wildlife manager has wildlife in their name doesn't mean that you're not dealing with livestock. You're often dealing with livestock, and often you're dealing with livestock-wildlife interactions. So maybe you have too many birds, um, maybe you have starlings that are coming to a feedlot, Okay? And these starlings are roosting in these feedlots and they're defecating everywhere. Okay? And, you know, are those starlings transferring disease to the livestock? Or are those starlings picking up disease from the livestock and transferring back into the wildlife community? Okay? And then what's the role that people play in that whole situation? Okay? So there's lots, tons of um, viral, bacterial and parasitic infections that can go zoonotic um, and uh, be of interest to humans. All right, so parasites. Let's look at some more definitions just so you understand where I'm coming from when I talk about parasitic infections. Parasites are a variety or type of symbiosis or symbiotic organism. Okay, symbiosis means living together. And there are interactions of symbionts, or those organisms that are living together. There are different types of interactions. Okay? So things like phoresis, okay, and that's where a organism is just traveling together. So you know, it just kind of hitches a ride on another organism. There's no interaction after that. Uh, there's no consumption of bodily fluids or anything like that. They just are traveling together. Okay, there's quite a few examples of, you know, uh, marine organisms that do this. Uh, they just hitch a ride and, and, and move um, from one region to another on another organism. Okay, um, mutualism, this is when organisms both benefit. Okay, so they both benefit from the interaction. Things like termites and the bacteria that live inside the termite's gut. Okay? Um, they both benefit. That bacteria breaks down cellulose. The termite then gets the sugars from that, but the bacteria gets nutrients okay, that the termite can then provide to the bacteria. And it also gets you know, a place to stay, a warm housing unit to stay in. So mutualism, there's mm, a few good examples of mutualism. Sometimes things are considered mutualism, but in reality it's actually commensalism, where one is actually benefiting and the other one, there's no harm or benefit to the other one. Okay, um, So things like cleaner wrasse and things like that that you know that are inside the mouth of a shark cleaning out things you know that's commensalism some people label it mutualism but trust me the shark's not getting a cavity it's not hurting the shark to have food in its teeth it's going to lose those teeth um, eventually uh, that's how shark teeth work and um, there's no real benefit for the shark okay there's no cost to the shark though by having that organism in its mouth cleaning and the shark's not going to consume the organism it's not really worth its time but for that wrasse um it's a it's a huge benefit okay? and then there's parasitism and there's really three main types of parasites parasites um and parasit parasitism is basically 
One benefits, the other's harmed, but the other is not dead. Okay? If the host dies from the parasite, then it's really not considered parasitism, it's considered predation. The reason parasitism is different than predation is because parasites often live a certain or have to have a certain portion of their life cycle has to be in that host or on that host. Okay. So that really, you know, is where parasitism comes about. It's not just consuming resources from another individual, but it's because the organism doesn't have the capability of raising its own young. It doesn't have the capability of that life cycle and it must encounter a host to do that. So, like I said, three main types, ectoparasites, which means the parasites on the external portion of the body. Okay, so it's on the outside of the body of the organism. Endoparasite or internal parasite, and then brood parasite. Now, brood parasites is kind of a different situation. Brood parasites are um, mainly nesting bird parasites, okay? although there are some examples of other organisms, some fish that will do brood parasitism. Okay? And that is you trick another species to raise your young. Okay? So you dump your eggs in another species nest. They raise your young. <clears throat> now, in some situations, this is really close to predation because that brood parasite will often destroy the young that it would be competing with, the native young. So it'll either throw the eggs out or the female will consume the eggs before she lays the eggs in the nest. Okay. But sometimes that's not the case. Sometimes those offspring are laid and you know they just occupy space all right the female the host female will incubate the egg it hatches and there's really no harm to the host except for you know she had to spend in or no no death to the host she just had to spend extra energy in raising that young so there is harm to the host but it's not in the way of death all right, so let's look at some wildlife parasites that are important. Now, again, I have to emphasize this in great detail. Parasites don't kill their host. Okay? Now, sometimes if a parasite gets into a host that's not actually their host, okay, so it's not the host that they evolved with, that organism will die. Okay. Um, so there you have a parasitic infection that becomes a, you know, a virulent disease. Okay. Virulent means death causing. Okay. That can happen. You have parasites that have evolved with a certain host. If that parasite gets into a host that's not that native host, it can cause that organism to die. Okay. Some w important ones, you know, from a wildlife point of view, um, trichinella, Chagas disease. Okay, Chagas disease is the disease that we thought, or many scientists think, um, Charles Darwin had from his time in South America. Um, you know, mange or scropotic mange. Okay. Most people know something about mange or have heard of mange. These are parasitic diseases that often occur in wildlife and can play a really important role in the sense that it can make the organism sick. It can make the organism act um, behaviorally. They can act very differently okay? and it can transfer from one organism to the next. And if you're talking about things like mange, which, you know, um, can cause you know, the organism to have open skin wounds and, and uh, you know, lose its fur and hair and things like that and cause other infections to come in, bacterial infections to come in, then they can, it can cause diseases when it's coupled with some of those other things. Okay? 
And so here, this is trichinella. Um, trichinella, uh, you know, is a blood parasite that will consume white blood cells. So it will make an organism fairly sick, and it decreases their immune function. Okay? But again, um, for the most part, it depends on where the trichinella is getting into, what's this, the host. For the most part, it's not going to kill the organism. It's not going to kill the host. Um, other things, uh, you know, um, other, I'm sorry. <laughs> this is this is trypanosoma. Um, sorry, this is trichinella. These are trichinella worms. Um, this is trypanosoma. Also uh, causes in humans. You can get bit by things like a titsy fly, um, and uh, you can get what's called African sleeping sickness. Okay. Um, so again, trypanosoma um, will eat red blood cells. Trichinella is like um, worms, often called pork worms, and they often occur in meat of wild organisms, actually in the gut lining often, and they can cause problems in humans. They can be zoonotic. So if you eat raw pork, um, you can get trichinella. You can get trichinella worms. Um, okay. <clears throat> fish, again, fish have their own groups of parasites um, that can be uh, zoonotic in the sense that they can pass on to humans. Nematodes, cestoids, and trematodes can all be um, passed to humans, different species. Mainly the way to, you get this is by eating raw fish, um, by eating uncooked material. But um, so zoonotic in the human case is from uncooked material, sushi, things like that, uh, can cause nematodes, cestoids, and trematodes. But wildlife can get these also because they're not cooking it. So bears and, and dogs and cats and things like that um, can get tapeworms and, and nematodes and trematodes from eating raw fish. Now, some of the parasites are just bizarre and awesome um, to look at or Maybe if you're really disgusted by things, um, then they're not. And they really don't cause a huge outbreak and in are infectious diseases and, and are concerned. But people are so interested in them because, you know, if you have this, you know, isopod or this crustacean that comes in and eats the tongue of a fish okay, and then sits in place of where the tongue was, and consumes nutrients from that fish, yes, it has a direct effect on the fish. Okay? It's not killing the fish, okay? but it does have a direct effect on the fish and <clears throat> can cause the fish to develop other diseases. This is quite possible, and, and I'll, I'll talk about that here in a second. But because people are so interested in parasites, things hanging off, like you know, anchor worms or bot flies hatching on organisms and popping out of their skin. Parasites are often associated with infectious diseases in a lot more gruesome and glorifying uh, manner than what they deserve. Most parasites are not killing organisms. Okay. Are they having an effect in growth and reproduction? It's possible. Remember, when we talked about, you know, that growth reproduction pie chart, if, you know, having a parasite resting in your mouth okay, increases the maintenance or decreases the amount of energy that you have to spend on reproduction or growth, it can have a direct effect on the organism. And they often do. But often it's not just the parasite that's causing it. So maybe it's the parasite that causes, you know, less nutrition or causes the organism to have to feed a little more. <clears throat> but then you couple that with environmental changes um, or climate change or environmental toxins or another disease, okay, a tapeworm um, or a bacterial infection or a viral infection. And then you can have, um, you know, 
some direct effects on that group of organisms. That can cause that fisheries to lose fish, or it can cause that wildlife management area to lose wildlife. And that's why managers are interested often in figuring out, well, what's parasite, what parasites are affecting these organisms also, okay? All right, so the role of management, really, um, I like I like to kind of divide it into uh, what a manager should be doing um, first, and that's preventing stupidity. Okay, so laws, regulations, education, that's what prevents stupidity. Okay, so <clears throat> there were, used to be a common practice called night soiling. Okay, night soil is human fecal material. Okay? That's spread on fields and things like that. And yes, the properties of human feces on a field is a great nutrient um, deposit. Okay? It's a great fertilizer. But night soiling, okay? taking fecal material and throwing it on a landscape, okay? and then consuming the material off that landscape, is a you know a direct cycle of a lot of parasites. Okay, so you you have parasite parasites in your body, you defecate their eggs out, or you know <clears throat> some proglottoids, maybe it's a tapeworm, some sections of it, and then you throw it on the landscape. Snails, ants, these kind of things can pick those organisms up. Okay, plant you know, and then they can deposit those. On plants, you can eat those plants, um, or they can transfer them to another organism. It's just a really bad idea, and in a lot of places, it's against the law. Now, recently, there have been some states that have brought it up. Maybe we should be able to use human feces and human excrement to fertilize our crops again. And I believe the state of Washington, maybe not, but I, I believe they passed at least some regulations that said that you could. Um, now, I'm not against this if <clears throat> it's not direct fecal material. If it's been compost, composted first, then uh, I, I don't have a problem with it. But direct fecal material on the landscape, um, is probably a bad idea from a parasitic uh, point of view. Okay? Pollution, okay? again, preventing stupidity, throwing bottles, throwing you know, uh, material on the landscape, in the rivers, dumping oil in the rivers and, and toxic waste in the rivers. Okay? There's regulations against this. Now, they're always changing. Okay? But that pollution um, has a direct effect uh, on the environment. Now, maybe it doesn't directly kill the frogs and the fish in the stream. Maybe it doesn't directly kill the deer that's drinking out of the water. But if it causes that organism to change how much energy goes into maintenance, because their lysosomes or other parts of their cells are extra active at filtering out toxins, then you are having a direct effect on that organism. And other things like toxic shot, and bullets, and fishing weights, and these other things that are made out of lead that really there's no reason for it. Um, you know, they need, the regulations need to be changed. Okay, there's no purpose of it. And if it can prevent pollution, um, then the regulations need to be changed, okay? So for the sake of condors and turkey vultures and the other vultures that are around um, in the world, you know, the use of toxic shot and bullets is, is, it really needs to be changed, okay? My opinion. Okay, management of infected populations. Okay? This is what managers do. You go out and if there's a bunch of, Organisms that are diseased, then, you know, the first thing to do is often that they do, managers do, is cull the population. Kill the diseased organisms. Now, like I said before, 
We wouldn't have to do this if we weren't managing so heavily for predators. If predators could kill off the infected organisms, then we probably wouldn't have to do it ourselves. Now, that's just a soapbox that I stand on. Um, you can take it however you want. Some, you know, managers would agree with me, but then disagree that we need to bring the predators back because of the political outfall that it would cause by bringing higher populations of predators. There are other management um, situations where you're not just culling off individuals. Maybe you're testing and vaccinating individuals. Okay, brucellosis is one of these that, um, you know, there is a lot of testing for brucellosis and, and managing from that point of view. Okay, but in cases where organisms have visual diseases, okay, like these um, bulbuses on, on this deer here, that's where the culling of the individual comes into play. Okay, clearly this individual is not going to get any better. Okay, and then finally, management of management. Okay. Um, the role of fish and wildlife managers is to do these two things, okay? prevent stupidity, manage the infected population, things like that. When it comes to diseases, um, that's, that's their role. But they also need to manage themselves. Okay? There are lots of situations that we've learned from in, from previous disease outbreaks that we humans cause that by poor management, okay? So like feeding grounds, for example. Okay? Feeding grounds in Wyoming and other states, um, elk feeding grounds, et cetera, when those organisms were fed, they're often fed in rows, okay? And the reason why you feed them in rows is because the individuals that's dropping off the hay or alfalfa or whatever the grassy material is that they're dropping off, they're, the easiest way for them to drop off is in a straight line, okay? You just drop it off. Every little bit of time, you drop off more, okay? Well, what we are seeing, especially in Wyoming, what we're seeing is elk that were coming in that had brucellosis, okay? They would feed in those direct lines, okay? And a female might abort a calf, or, yeah, might abort a calf Okay. because she had brucellosis. Well, all the animals that be, are behind her in that line or are part of that line that's walking in along this linear you know, pile of material, they're encountering that offspring. They're encountering that bacterial infection. And they were picking it up. So managers started saying, all right, feeding grounds, we need to, you know, randomly place the material out there. So there's no more straight lines. And what the data that we have from that is drastic, okay? Where in straight lines, we might have had a 35 to 40% of the elk that were coming in tested positive for brucellosis. In the randomly placed regions is more like 5%. Well, 5%, most managers can live with 5%, okay? But when almost half or close to half of your population has an abortion disease, okay, you know that you're, you're in trouble for recruitment, that you know, you're not gonna have very many babies being born. Fishing nets and gear and things like that, for a long time, that was never cleaned, okay? That was never, you know, uh, managed very well and we are moving things around we're moving you know parasites around and obviously invasive species zebra mussels and things like that they get moved around that's a different story for a different time but we were moving parasites from one region to the next okay? because we weren't managing ourselves okay? so with that being said uh, this is kind of the end of the disease lecture, <clears throat> but nonetheless, it's just an overview. If you're interested in diseases or parasites, there's literally thousands of books out there, lots of courses um, at many universities that uh, can dive into the different diseases that um, mammals can get, or marine mammals, or birds, or amphibians, or reptiles, or fish. Um, 
because there's lots of diseases out there and uh, that can play an important role in how a manager manages for a certain population. Okay, so until next time.